I count it a privilege to introduce to you our guest speaker, lecturer for this week. I've known Dr. Michael Quick for a long time, although I haven't seen him in ages, I think back in the 1970s. How in the world do you stay looking so young, Michael? It's quite remarkable. Um, it's a great joy to see him again. I would like some people who suspect me of national bias to notice that with great cordiality I welcome this Englishman. <laughs> and I hope our late distinguished professor of New Testament will relay that piece of information to his wife if she's not here, um, which sounds particularly appropriate in the environment of Acadia Divinity College. Dr. Michael Quick serves as the Kohler Professor of Preaching and Communication at the Northern Baptist Theological Seminary in Illinois, in Lombard. And they live in Chicago, he and his wife, Carol. And as I introduce Michael Quick, I want to say a word of special welcome to his wife, Carol. Carol had some quite major surgery just 10 or 11 days ago and has been very brave to make the journey from Chicago to here. Mind you, any, I can understand anybody wanting to get out of Chicago, of course, um, but we're delighted that you made the journey, and we hope that you will find not only your husband's ministry refreshing, but the fellowship of other Christians here refreshing too. Dr. Quick has a very interesting academic background. He has master's degrees from both Oxford and Cambridge universities, which are rather distinguished institutions, as you may know. And um, his doctorate comes from a, a very well-known American school, the William Jewell College. He's got a lot of experience in uh, academic life, of course. He was born in London. He was educated, as I said, at both Cambridge and Oxford. And then he spent 21 years in pastoral ministry in England. Outstanding ministry, particularly his key ministry in Cambridge at the City Centre Church, during which time God richly blessed his ministry in the growth of the church when morning attendances grew over the years from about 70 to something in the order of 500 people. It was a pretty exciting kind of ministry, and during that time he also served as Baptist chaplain to the university in Cambridge. He's known worldwide, of course, as a speaker, as a lecturer, as a preacher, I'm fascinated to see some of the common places we've been to, um, Michael, when I realize that you spoke at Interlaken this July, and I spoke at the same conference, wait for it, 33 years ago, which tells you something else, which we won't get into tonight. Um, before going to Chicago, Dr. Quick served as principal of Spurgeon's College in London, which is a very large theological institution, the largest Baptist institution of its kind in Europe, and had a profound influence on its development. It's a remarkable school anyway, and it's had some, a succession of quite outstanding principles. And Michael Quick stands high in that list of distinction. He's given lectures all around the world, and uh, he has published quite widely. In particular, I'm happy to welcome him tonight because he has written a book quite recently. In fact, I happened to be teaching the course on homiletics this year, and I discovered when I was preparing the course that he was publishing a new book in November of 2003. And lo and behold, it was in November 2003 I had to turn my course description in. And uh, I included in it Michael Quick's book, 360 Degree Preaching, a quite strange title, don't you think? Um, it isn't that students are left going around in circles, uh, although some preachers do that quite adequately. There's another, he has two strange ideas. The one is 360 degree preaching. There's only one way you'll discover what this is about, because I'm not going to tell you. I know what it's about. I've read this book very carefully, indeed. I couldn't afford to be teaching a class of students who are required to read it if I had not read it. It's an excellent book. He's got another fascinating idea. He calls it, you can tell he's a Baptist, he calls it the preaching swim. And if that hasn't got your interest, I don't know what will. If you're a preacher 
This book is on sale here, and I would be untrue to my ethnic origins if I didn't push it. I expect you preachers to pick up a copy of this and to benefit from it as, as my students are doing. One of the most exciting passages in this book is the stages. By the way, he's going to be on a stage himself tonight. It'll be interesting for a preacher to have to perform on this apron stage. But he's got five stages in his preaching development. And they're just great. The first one is immerse yourself in Scripture. I can't think of any better starting place for a preacher of the gospel. Interpret it for today, number two. Number three, design your sermon. Number four, deliver the sermon. And then number five, with joy, experience the outcomes. Dr. Michael Quick, we are honored. Remarkably like a trap door just to my left. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's, there's always a fear when there's a lot of space around you as to what might happen. And so uh, I've got my wife, one of the reasons she came is she always looks out for me, so she's just going to raise the alarm if anybody comes on or anything, uh, sudden backdrops. It, it really is a remarkable place. And to have you sort of around like this, um, that's good, though I can hardly see you. Uh, maybe that's good too. Anyway, I'm looking forward immensely to this. And it was very tempting, very tempting, uh, to take this uh, book, 360 Degree Preaching, and uh, develop one or two of its themes. Uh, tempting because I've worked hard on it. My wife knows I've worked hard on it, and it endangered uh, our marriage at one point, uh, when it wasn't finished as it should be. Uh, I also still believe in it. And uh, you know when you've uh, written something a little while ago and it takes a year, it's good when the, you still believe in it. And I do. But I also, over these last few months, have been pushed with a, a burden. It might sound rather pretentious, but I've had a burden. And occasionally it's uh, so pressed upon me that I've sort of yelped Actually, on page 36 of my book, I yelp. Preachers have lost the art of leadership through the proclaimed word. There's too little courage and too much safe predictability. So, too little confrontation of evil by Christ's power and too much soothing of the already convinced. Fewer people can imagine that revival and renewal could ever come from preaching. I agree that two driving forces for good have become separated. Leadership from preaching. They've grown apart, they've stopped speaking to each other, and their disconnections greatly harming the local church. Now, unashamedly, I'm talking about the local church, these three lectures. I believe God created local church to spearhead his kingdom. I know it falls short of the ideal, and it's because of unholy people like me. Possibly you. Uh, when Christopher Idol uh, designated different characters in Winnie the Pooh to uh, stand for different denominations, he said Winnie the Pooh was clearly Anglican, uh, Tigger was Pentecostal, but without a shadow of doubt, Rabbit was Baptist. This is because of the obsession with washings, with resolutions, which uh, keep organizing everybody. And, but most of all, he said, because of the innumerable relations representing the splits, persuasions, and separations of the family. There are, I'm told, in the U.S., 47 different Baptist denominations, many of whom are not speaking to each other. Well, in spite of that, by God's mysterious choosing, he has chosen the local church. 
as the place where men and women, the only place men and women can together be so joined that they flesh out the grace possibilities of forgiven men and women. Only in local church can people belong under Christ's lordship in body. Only by local church can communities be salted and lit and send out missionaries. Churches are part of God's cosmic master plan, Colossians 1.18, and there is no plan B. However, a phenomenon has grown over the last 30 years. The rise and rise and rise of leadership studies. Uh, in the 30-year period I've ministered, and I can illustrate something of that rise by two examples drawn. One from the beginning, when I was a local pastor in Blackburn in Lancashire, and then towards the end, when I was principal at Spurgeon's. I recall my disturbance in 1972, when in the eight months between receiving my call to the church in Blackburn and actually arriving, I was finishing at seminary, in the eight months I received notice that an architect had discovered such serious dry rot in the main building that he felt the entire building should come down. And the chair of the management committee wrote to me a gracious letter inviting me to withdraw because they said it wasn't fair on any young man to come into a church with a building crisis and no money. With equal measures of trust and uh, naivety, I believe that God had called me, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health. And when I went to Blackburn, I preached my first sermon, In the Beginning, God, Genesis 1. My second sermon was, In the Beginning, the Word. My third sermon was, Christ says, My Kingdom. Big, big themes. And for seven years, I preached my heart out long even I might grow in faith and vision through a building crisis, and crisis it was, into a vision for the people of God and far beyond in the neighborhood where we served. And uh, leadership studies were almost non-existent. If a vision, vision statement or mission statement had bitten me on the nose, I wouldn't have recognized it. There were the usual Baptist structures, of course, deacons' meetings and church meetings. But I have to say, truthfully, preaching in worship seemed central to the ensuing events of church life and of mission, which turned out to be exhilaratingly untidy and very surprising. And I understood somehow the spiritual gift of leadership was fused with preaching. Roll on to 1993, and as principal of Spurgeon's, I'm given my first leadership book from a business world. My administrator comes up to me, a new man, in his first day and thrusts it into my hand and said, read this, uh, please. It's uh, Built to Last by James Collins and Jerry Porras, which has become one of the great uh, books, uh, the, the classics of leadership 18 world-beating companies and how they compare with their competitors who weren't quite as successful. Now, I read it with fascination. Uh, it seemed to me all kinds of myths were demolished. We were told to, to avoid the tyranny of the either-or. And any organization worth anything has a B-hag, B-H-A-G, a big, hairy, audacious goal. Why hairy, I don't know. But anyway. And it seemed to me, though God was not mentioned, there was so much that resonated with me. After all, isn't Matthew 28, 19, 20 the biggest B-H-A-G there is? So much made sense. And since that point, for many years, I've been going to leadership conferences and reading resources. In a survey, 2003, amongst pastors in North America, 94% of pastors said they had been on leadership conferences or used leadership resources. And uh, that's the way it has been. Now, many positive results have flowed from this. And I want to show that, speak about that tonight and other times. But there's been one disastrous consequence. The eclipse of the preacher leader. 
The older model of local church need, needed a preacher leader with a, a complex organism focused on Sunday worship around word and sacrament, as we used to say. Community life happened around public ministry, which then flowed into other church activities. But when an organization is structured on business principles, it has no critical need for preacher leaders. Of course, it needs preachers, but they have no critical role for leadership. Much of the extensive literature on church leadership has little or nothing good to say about preaching. Some is hostile. Thomas Bandy critiques traditional preaching for its wordiness and its ego and its rejection of new technologies. He says it separates clergy from laity. It acts like a CEO to stockholders. Bandy encourages instead good coaching as a model, which relates as a friend to friend and a team to team. And when he looks for animation, synergy, passion in his team building model for the future, there seems to be no room for preaching. Many who write on leadership make scant reference to preaching. One of Kenan Callahan's 12 keys to an effective church is corporate dynamic worship. He describes five factors as important. Warmth, music, preaching, liturgy, and seating, uh, which I guess is important. Uh, preaching receives minimal attention. A turn to Christian Sports, who identifies one of his eight characteristics for natural church growth as inspiring worship. Yet within that, preaching seems to have no role. Even very gifted preacher leaders seem to emphasize other aspects of leadership rather than the, the role that preaching takes within leadership. Uh, Rick Warren, with his purpose-driven church, recognizes preaching as important. He dedicates it to bivocational pastors. He has a section on preaching to be unchurched. And one paragraph on the primacy of preaching. And though so much hangs upon preaching, there is little expressed advice about how preaching might act. Bill Hybels, the local guru in Chicago, similarly presumes preaching is important, but gives too little practical expression. Aubrey Malfer, values-driven leadership, actually presupposes preaching, but he only addresses it very briefly and late in his book. And the book that I'm tending to use more because I hear more and more people talking about it having used it is the book by Harrington, Bonham and Fur called Leading Congregational Change. And all the way through it resonates about preaching yet doesn't mention it. Ironically, in Mirror Image, preaching's large literature, extensive literature with incredible books uh, like 360 pre degree preaching, for example, this often lacks any explicit reference to leadership too. In fact, I only know of one book on preaching which in recent years actually draws leadership into its title by John McClure. It's entitled Round Table Preaching, where preaching and leadership meet. And in his book, he recommends we have collaborative preaching models where we work together in teams uh, preparing the sermons so that the church participates in leadership in that way. It's a rare mention, and it seems a different era since John Killinger wrote The Centrality of Preaching to the Total Task of Ministry. It was in 1964. Today the book would be The Centrality of Leadership to the Total Task of Ministry. Wouldn't it? I want to argue tonight just in two sections that uh, we have colluding factors, but uh, leadership desperately needs preaching, and I believe preaching needs leadership. The colluding factors, just for a moment or two, which uh, aid and abet this preaching's displacement by leadership. There's been a loss of biblical holism. Biblical doctrine of creation declares everything that God made is good. And no distinctions between the uh, spiritual and the material. Everything belongs to him. But with the influence of Greek philosophy, especially Plato, many Christians have been taken hostage, separating sacred from material. 
Plato taught that the visible world is in reality only a world of shadows, a copy of the eternal world of spiritual forms to which the pure soul could attain by philosophic contemplation. And under Platonic influence, many believe that uh, God calls preachers to concentrate on what's all important and totally important to spiritual concerns. And church organization and finance and plant and vision and strategy, well, that can be left since it's secondary to secular expertise. And we've split what God's intended to be whole. And closely linked with this split between sacred and secular is the treatment of the preacher as employee in the triumph of function. Many churches function like business organizations, concentrating on the bottom line, what Callaghan calls the three M's. Membership, it said the most fraudulent statistics in the States are church membership statistics. Uh, maintenance, the budgets and the committees, and all that's determined to at least stay with last year's targets. And lastly, money. This focus stays inside the church and often relegates preachers uh, to a task of keeping the machine going, winning new members, of course, keeping old members. But says William Eason, congregations whose membership has plateaued or is declining have much in common with dinosaurs. Both have great heritages, both require immense amounts of food, both became endangered species. Most of their time, energy and money is spent foraging for food for themselves, so that little time is left to feed the unchurched. Malfour's complains of the hard hand concept, rather than the spiritual gift of leadership, so that the whole church might express ministry. Ephesians 4, 11 to 13. He asks, where did this hired hand concept come from? It's primarily cultural. In fact, 85 to 90 percent of what the typical church does today is influenced by its culture, not the Bible. One pastor wrote me an email, everything boils down to whether the local church views the pastor as an employee or as a leader. And another pastor said to me, you'll never be able to bridge the gap between the pulpit and the board. I'm allowed to teach the Bible. Other people run the church. Now, preachers can easily abuse their position. Uh, we know that, sadly. And we can manipulate. Underwood warned about the preacher as despot. But in too many places, the preacher's role has been emasculated to chaplain to individual needs and cheerleader to organizational machismo. And it remains true. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. 1 Samuel 3, 1. There's uh, been a loss of biblical holism and a triumph of function in too many places. There's also been a misdefinition of preaching. In all the interest in leadership, there's been a sidelining of preaching's role. Too often, preaching has been given a role that does not have leadership qualities. And much of this revolves around a misdefinition of preaching as solely teaching. For some, soul teaching has meant educating the church cerebrally, nurturing the church pastorally. A shepherd role of feeding the church, but not leading it. Nowhere is as clearer than in Barna's outburst in Christianity Today, August 2002, about the desperate lack of leaders in the church in North America. He comments, that, listen, the people who fill the positions of leadership in churches today are for the most part teachers, good people, lovers of God, well-educated, gifted communicators, but not leaders. They do not have or understand vision. They are incapable of motivating and mobilizing people around God's vision. They fail to direct people's energies and resources effectively and efficiently. Notice how he divides preachers who he sees as well-educated, uh, gifted teachers, 
from the leaders of vision. On the one hand, they're preachers who deal with individual uh, spirituality. And on the other hand, there are leaders who motivate, mobilize, and direct people's energies and resources as a community. And a gloomy Barna sees a lot of these and very few of these. Now, there is confusion. One of the things I'm looking forward to over these next three days is getting to know you, getting your feedback. And I really need it. And I'm just making the beginnings of a journey into this big area. But in a survey, 2003, uh, pastors and congregates discovered 92% pastors considered themselves as leaders. 94% of the congregants agreed with that. But... Most define their leadership as shepherding and bridge building. When they were asked whether they saw themselves as visionary and strategizing, the proportion dropped to one in three. Two types of preaching were contrasted. One was teaching, and 80% said that was their spiritual gift. The other was exhortation, preaching to motivate change. Uh, only 32% of pastors who've been in their churches more than five years saw exhortation as their gift. And when congregants were asked about their pastor's leadership qualities, they often rated them lower than the pastors did themselves. When asked if they were adaptable, 72% of the pastors said, of course, and 48% of the congregants agreed. Team players, 71% of pastors said, yes, that's me. And 53% of the congregants agreed. And as for being analytical, 54% of the pastors said, yes, that's me. And 29% of the congregants agreed. It's no wonder that in many places, preachers are considered to be maintainers rather than initiators. Safe pairs of hands to keep structures stable, rather than big souls daring to live on the edge. Preaching as teaching, soul teaching, has allowed itself to be detached from the task of leading congregational change. And preachers have become bit players on the margins of leadership. It's my conviction that God chose preaching to be the primary means by which Jesus Christ, the word made flesh, communicates good news and announces the kingdom. And in the Gospels, God's words heard in the present tense. It's prophetic, transformational and incarnational, as I argue in 360 degree preaching. And subsequent biblical preaching is Trinitarian in its theology and its empowerment. And though teaching is there, it's a part of it. I argue for different kinds of preaching. I also argue for a definition which is broader. And I dare, as some of you will know and read, Christian preaching at its best is a biblical speaking, listening, seeing, doing event that God empowers to form Christ shaped people and communities. Such dynamic understanding makes preaching central to the process of understanding and responding to God's will and direction. And when God gifts leaders to his church, he uses people who use words, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers, Ephesians 4.11, in order to prepare God's people for works of service. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. And leadership, like all other aspects of church life and mission, needs to be directed and nurtured by God's word, which is heard best in preaching. Leadership needs preaching. Leadership urgently needs preaching. It should flow out of the same 360 degree dynamic of God's word returning to himself for his glory. The same God in three persons who empowers preaching so that his word does not return to him void. Isaiah 55:11 gives power to his people so that they should not live in vain. 
360 degree preaching means 360 degree leading. And by his word in scripture, God makes his purpose clear. And through preachers, by his spirit, this ancient word is fired into life for vision, conviction, and action in the 21st century. As a preacher friend of mine says, every time I preach, I lead. Whenever I open up God's word, I lead. When leadership's disconnected from preaching, local change churches are endangered. There are many risks. Let me just mention four briefly. First, leadership principles without preaching can encourage humanistic models. After all, it's Argo, does it, does it really matter that business books and organization fail to mention God? They're such common sense, success-oriented principles. They're going to work for the church as well. Surely not everything has to begin with scripture when there's so much good advice around. But the people of God, unlike any other people, owe their existence utterly to the grace of God who reveals himself most clearly in scripture and in Christ. And everything begins in Revelation. And Jesus exploded on the world scene, inviting people to live in a new way spiritually. Lord of a new kingdom, unique, an organism, body of fellowship, growing by grace and nourished by love and burning in mission. His name cannot be used to endorse other models. If it's not Kellogg's on the box, it's not Kellogg's in the box. You can't use the name of Jesus to Christianize other stuff when he himself has created what no one else has. And when we read the gospel, we see it's true. And we turn to Mark 10 and we see that leadership is unlike any other leadership the world has ever seen. And John 13, and it's never like anything we've seen. And i would be preaching on that tomorrow. Leadership principles, secondly, without preaching, can flatten spiritual paradox and squeeze out Christianity's essence. Rational organizational planning finds it very difficult to deal with language like waiting on the Lord to renew strength with eagle's wings. I, for goodness sake, eagle's wings. Strength in weakness. Riches in poverty. The first being last. You, you know them. It, it, it just doesn't work as well. Uh, intentional processes build towards efficiency and success. And in too many churches, a clear thinking and solid action is assumed to guarantee success and to omit entirely the paradox which is at the heart of gospel. Thirdly, leadership principles without preaching can too easily dispense with God's presence and power. Local churches can use skills programmatically to great effect without needing actually to depend on God for anything much. To misquote Zechariah 4.6, by might, by power, and not by my spirit, says the church almighty. Some leadership models do not actually need God to do anything. In fact, God would rather complicate things if he became involved. Fourthly, leadership principles without preaching can bypass corporate spiritual wisdom. Uh, of course, leadership models stress the value of team, and many of us haven't learned that yet. But the New Testament always speaks of the spirit giving wisdom, and how people, as the spirit breathes upon the church, brings wisdom together. And it contrasts powerfully with the wisdom of this world. Indeed, we can, the end of uh, 1 Corinthians 2, we can have the mind of Christ. What does that mean? And we can declare it seems good to us and the Holy Spirit. A passion for clear-cut, measurable outcomes so often seems to bypass the work of the Holy Spirit who blows where he wills. Business models can reshape churches into marketing organizations that measure success primarily in terms of numbers and finances. 
Preaching ensures that God's word by God's power guides and shapes his people who were once no people, but are now his people. Yet, at the same time, it must be strongly stated that preaching desperately needs to learn about leadership. My earlier definition of preaching might seem so self-aggrandizing, but it, it swings the pendulum to the other extreme and marginalizes leadership, as though elevation of word and sacrament relegates leadership to lower order techniques. And this falls exactly into the trap of dividing sacred and secular that I warned against earlier. Leadership studies have proved immensely valuable, bringing realism, understanding, and process into the leadership task. Without leadership studies, preaching can be woolly in its piety and naive in its application. There are several reasons why preaching needs leadership. I can think of some of the important words in the vocabulary that it emphasizes for us. For example, the word change. Leadership studies are realistic about change and the context. Arvin Toffler was the first to write about future change and about the 800th lifetime in which he said most of the resources we use have been developed within the lifetime and about the dislocation of the rate of change. And since then, we've begun to understand through studies just how much change there is in a place where you've got the greatest Variation in tides, so I'm told. We should understand why Len Sweet talks about the tsunami, the tidal waves of change from modernity to post-modernity, which I've come to believe in. I didn't five years ago, but I had to read as I came to Chicago because I was writing on the issue. And I recognize there are big, big, big changes afoot and these changes are often discontinuous and leaders bear a disproportionate share of responsibility for leading change. Sadly, in contrast to often preachers have continued to specialize in general themes for no one in particular. Generic applications are trotted out that could have applied 50 years before. Many assume that we only need to go on doing what we have been doing in the past. Church leaders of the past could be successful by gradually improving on what their predecessors had done. The current setting for ministry demands continuous learning. Of course, preachers preach change. I mean, that's the irony. New birth, new life, new creation. But if possible, we try and make sure this newness is radical but doesn't change too much around it. So, so our organizations remain stable and, and if possible, people remain as happy as they can be. So new Christians, please, but in a protected environment. That becomes our goal and we agree perhaps with John Betjeman and his take on backward Christian soldiers fleeing from the fight with the cross of Jesus nearly out of sight. <clears throat> and the last verse, sit here then ye people, join our useless throng, blend with ours your voices in a feeble song, blessings, ease and comfort, ask from Christ the King, with our modern thinking we won't do a thing. Leadership's realistic about change, very realistic about change. And with that comes realism about conflict. I admire the literature on conflict management and the ways in which conflict is being taken as something serious because we know it can be life-threatening when people lose vision, but conflict can be life-giving when new understandings emerge. Often preachers have been educated to pacify and avoid conflict at all costs. Conflict is deeply unhealthy. We empathize with that pastor quoted by Harrington. All my life, I've judged my success by how happy everyone in the church was. You're telling me that if I'm really on mission with God, one sign of my success will be the presence of conflict? We often fall into the old trap. It's as old as Jeremiah 6 and 7 of preaching peace, peace when there is no peace. 
And true peace does not evade tension. It emerges from it in honest new health. And we have much to learn about conflict of preachers. We have much to learn about evaluation. Leadership stress evaluation that will not fudge analysis. When Harrington developed their model, it began with a, member, with a statistical survey of 100 churches over 40 years from 1950 to 1989. And every trend was up for these churches, 100 Baptist churches in Texas, and they congratulated themselves until they realized that when they put alongside it the growth of a city, every year they'd lost ground compared with the size of a community around them. Optimistic self-interest often keeps us from asking too many hard questions. A friend of mine did a sabbatical in the UK, visiting successful churches, pastors of growing churches. I asked him his findings. He said, well, actually, one thing I noticed was true of every one of them. In every single case, the pastor exaggerated the size of their congregation. I counted them. The context for the mainstream church is one of decline. Lyle Schaller says 60% of all U.S. churches will have disappeared by the year 2060. Evaluation is sobering, and we preachers need more of it. Another word for me is intentionality. It seems to me that when you open leadership studies, there's a concern that something is happening, must happen, to bring about change in desperate need. In world church terms, of course, there is remarkable growth, but it's all in Latin America and Africa and, and Asia. Eddie Gibbs says that uh, any church in North America is one generation away, potentially, from extinction. We, we need talk of vision and strategy. We need intentionality. And into all this, there comes that rich literature of leadership, which helps us understand what we're doing and what we might be doing. All sorts of things. For example, the distinction between transactional leaders and transformational leaders. Building on Burns' seminal work in 1978, many others have worked on this. Transactional leaders... Uh, that's based on transactions, exchanges between leaders and followers. People have certain needs, physical, emotional, securities. And transactional leaders influence situations so that everybody wins out with a basic self-interest fulfilled. In church terms, a leader can work for increased membership, a stable maintenance and a healthy finance so that its members can enjoy a sense of pride in their organisation and they can gain the admiration of others. And for this, the leader will be rewarded financially with flattery, with loyalty, and this does tend towards status quo. However, transformational leaders, says Burns, help Followers embrace a vision of a preferred future. Leaders inspire and empower followers to achieve new levels of personal and corporate performance. And followers gladly commit to a future they help to create. In order for leaders to be transformational, they will run risks. They will live by faith. They will need to develop certain disciplines, and I will look at these in my third lecture. Another important piece of research is focused on levels of commitment and Peter Senge in his fifth discipline draws the contrast between the level of commitment where people willingly open themselves out to the cost of change and the new with four levels of what he calls compliance. A genuine compliance where people do some movement within the structures formal compliance where there's the minimum to get by a grudging compliance where just something and non-compliance. And so much preaching goes for compliance and not commitment. And we need the challenge of recognizing how many different levels there are and what our challenges are too. 
In order for transformational leaders to win commitment, leaders have stressed the need for mental models. Rick Warren is one of the most famous with his five goals. A systems thinking as to how things belong and work together. Uh, for us, especially, that's important. The body, the body, the body. The place of teams and collaboration. The significance of listening. And within much of a literature, the encouraging lesson that we can learn these skills. That even though it's daunting and new, we can learn them. Leadership needs preaching. But so does preaching need leadership. When Christ calls preachers for his church, he creates unique leaders. Men and women who declare his word today so that by the grace of God, people commit into transformation, Romans 12. Change from glory into glory. We believe that God reveals his word and his purpose by his word. And the obvious place for church vision remains the pulpit. No one's more visible. No one has higher profile. Quality time, corporate time for relationships and for truth growing than the preacher. And no one is more spiritually empowered the value of leadership studies is that it will not leave such claims vague and sentimental. It, it will sharpen intentionality at the heart of a preacher's work. And as I work through issues, and I, I'm keen to use models, and I'm keen to learn about what's happening, I as a preacher lead along that there might be a fusing of the best as God works in our midst. Bill Hybels writes of a modern-day tragedy in his book, Courageous Leadership. He says, all over the world, in churches, people have never been led. They've been taught to, preached to, and taught. They've been fellowshipped and Bible-studied. But with no one to inspire them, to mobilize them, their desire to make a difference for Christ has been completely frustrated. I believe that the great tragedy of the church in our time has been its failure to recognize the importance of the spiritual gift of leadership. It appears to me that only a fraction of pastors worldwide are exercising the spiritual gift of leadership. These lectures are my call to express the spiritual gift of leadership through preaching. I believe God calls us to that today. That's the end. No, you don't need to do that. If you would like to raise some questions of Dr. Quick, we have a few moments. Uh, a little bit later, we will be having a reception in the, uh, the lobby. And uh, uh, then uh, you might also want to pick up one of his books. I suspect he might even be willing to autograph it uh, for you. And uh, uh, following the time of questions, I'll give him an advance notice. Normally, an executive minister would know how to preach, pray, or die inside of a moment, but I'm going to give him at least a minute to think about it. Dr. Harry Gardner, our executive minister, to lead us in our closing prayer for tonight. But are there questions that you would like to uh, raise with Dr. Quick, and we'll let him receive the questions. That's a very good question. Lyle Schaller is obviously uh, concerned uh, statistically with the fact that most churches are small and many of those churches are clearly in that bracket of 60 to 100 members, uh, which actually is the focus of his book by Harrington, Bonham and Fur. They are concerned about uh, smaller churches and their life because many of them have been around for a while and relative to their populations, they're declining. The big debate, and many of you will know this, is about the mega churches and their role. And uh, many people out there, I heard Leith Anderson, I've heard, well, I think Leith Anderson was the, the most recent.
<clears throat> speaking, and Eddie Gibbs is another, speaking about how uh, confusing it is to work out what exactly is happening. Eddie Gibbs says that in North America there are no unchurched people, they are de-churched. <laughs> and they often, they're being reconnected in megachurches. And one is grateful for that, but there is not actually a spiritual vitality uh, which actually registers in terms of mission in the locality. Now, these things are, 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 are big, and I'm by no means well read in them. What I do perceive, however, is that in many places, when I visit them 20 years on, uh, congregations have become older, the numbers of young people are fewer, uh, absences of people in their 20s, and, of course, sometimes the children's work. In Thomas Reeves' book, The Empty Pulpit, uh, which some of you may know, he analysed seven mainstream denominations in North America from mid, uh, 1965. And he found that these seven mainstream denominations, which were United Methodist and American Baptist and uh, Presbyterians, but in analysing them, each of them had lost between a third and a half of their members. And the United Methodists, for example, in a survey in 1995, discovered that between 1965 and 1995, they lost 1,000 members every single week. So there is a, a hemorrhaging. And I think what Shallow is doing is looking at this, and obviously uh, with uh, some hyperbole, just looking at what might happen, reckoning that many churches are smaller, uh, aging, and not connecting with their localities. I, I, that's the best I can answer, but maybe there are going to be other people here who've got much more insight, in, I'm sure there are, into some of this, because it's a whole uh, industry and a rich uh, literature. That's great. I wonder how many of us actually... See, I went to seminary in Oxford, and I'm very grateful because I was really stretched intellectually. I, I'm very grateful for it. But how long do you think I had preparing to preach in uh, three years of very demanding seminary work? One hour. That was all. And we were thrown into the lion's den to do our preaching uh, once a year to the entire a crowd without a clue. I mean, that was very obvious. And uh, the, the feeling was that if you hadn't been called to preach, well, you probably wouldn't be able to do it. And the truth of the matter is that you might pick it up on the way. And the whole sense of the burden of God's word being heard and expressed was, was just not there. And so, as I emerged in the um, early 70s and went through... There has certainly, I think, been a denigration of the word. And I've got all kinds of things going on, I think, when I, when I reflect on my preparation and where seminaries are seeking to be today. You know, seminaries have been criticised very strongly by some leadership uh, materials for producing managers rather than leaders. Uh, that's one of the strong things. And I, I think there has been at times a failure to understand. Let's be blunt about it. The supernatural power of a God who breaks into lives and changes and breaks them open and makes new things happen. 
We, we haven't dared, some of us, to realize how God can do it, even in our place. We've read about it in other places. We've heard about it, we rather admire. But many of us are scared and have never been there. And frankly, we, we, I mean, we want to say challenging things, but we don't want too much challenge because we, we know it could be awkward to deal with. And we don't even know spiritually how we might cope with, you know, if people start raising all sorts of stuff. And the truth is that uh, many of us like to be managers and we are actually called to proclaim with a boldness stuff that really sets us on fire. I think we have to learn it. You ask, can it be taught or caught? I hope you can teach some things. But you know, I think most of the teaching comes through who we are. I mean, the teachers I remember is essentially who they were. And to hear and to see and, and, and to see people, I believe in mentoring as a very powerful tool, you suddenly are drawn into the possibilities. Um, I mention in my book that every time I have a class, every class, I always ask the same question to. And I say to them, and the classes are, are deliberately kept small. Uh, the limits are 24 because they all have to preach and all the rest. So I say to them, how many of you here regularly look forward to the regular preaching that you hear in your churches? How many of you here look forward regularly to the preaching you hear in your churches? Now, most of them are, uh, there are one or two who are preachers, always put their hands up, of course. Uh, and uh, one or two who have come in to audit. I, I'm talking mostly, though, to people who just worship around. And over the years I've been doing this, the number who say they do is between a third, uh, may just reach half. And I say to the others, have I got that right? Then you don't look forward to the preaching. Oh no, they said. We love the worship, as though preaching's got nothing to do with that. Oh, well, that's another debate. But you know, we love the music, we love the fellowship, we love the program for our kids. And uh, the part, he's a really nice pastor. But oh, no, not the preaching. Now, this is an indication, I think, that some of us have rather lost this love and this call, which maybe we have to rediscover. And we need encouragement in doing that. And what you touch on is a deep, deep issue of how do we rekindle a love if we've lost our way, if we're disheartened. And I think we need one another, and we certainly need the Holy Spirit. I would love when we... Oh, there is one more. Yeah. Yes, I, I, I say in the book, and I say when I teach it, that um, you've got to come clean about what preaching is. And the higher you raise the stakes, then the, the more demanding it's going to be. Uh, if you believe that preaching is prophetic, but there's a todayness that God speaks his word, you are raising the stakes. And if you believe it's transformational, but people can be changed, you are raising the stakes. And if you say it's incarnational, in other words, just as the words became flesh in Jesus, so words with a little w become in flesh through you. So you talk of forgiveness, but you actually have experienced forgiveness in this body, and you also know the difficulty of expressing forgiveness to others. And the very struggle of what it means to be forgiven to forgive others is something you embody then you are raising the stakes for preaching. Now, it's all very well with our heads to say that about incarnational. But the truth is that I believe that God has moved in the tides of history and there's been renewal and revival when men and women have been so broken open by the word that they are vulnerable, uh, they are real, 
there is not that they confess all this stuff, it's just that people recognize in themselves that this is true. You know, this is real. This person standing at the front, it matters to them. And incarnational preaching speaks not just about issuing information, I'm going to say this tomorrow, stuff that is kind of information that you have as a package and you make neat and you hand it over. But it actually comes because I have heard God's word. I can hardly believe it. I don't know how it's going to work in my life. You know, I had a disagreement with my wife earlier today, which I, I didn't actually. But I, if I had had a different... But, but actually, I can't just speak this as though it doesn't affect where I'm coming from and who I am. And uh, you mentioned black preaching. I think black preaching has taught us a lot. I have a third of my classes are African-American. And though there's theatre and performance, and some of them are very critical about that, my African-American friends, nonetheless, often there's a realism and an openness, which means, you know, friends, do you feel this? Because I feel it. <laughs> Whereas in some white congregations, I know the atmosphere is one of uh, frozen compartments uh, and, and uh, not a flicker. In fact, I mean, not a flicker. You wonder whether everybody's still uh, even alive at the end. <laughs> so, incarnational preaching. Now, if you say those things, and I keep saying it when I'm teaching right the way through the course, do you believe it? Then you can't preach the same old way. And you can't do what your, your pastor does if you happen to think he's the greatest thing or you see so-and-so on television. You can't do it. Because it has to be your flesh, your experience, and your li limited experiences which you pray God is going to pour some element of grace through. So, yes, thank you for that. And thank you for reading it. Brother, you'll tell others.